And then, I don't know, some of y'all spoil your kids at $10, $5. We're doing a dollar at my house. We're kind of keeping the inflation rate low. And uh, it is a dollar. And even if I don't have a, a paper, I mean, the Toothberry doesn't have a paper dollar. He'll come up with four quarters if he has to. There's always a dollar. But that's not true. It's not always. Because what has happened a couple of times? Uh, apparently, the Tooth Fairy got really big. There was too many kids that night. And he didn't make it to our house. Y'all ever been there? And the kid wakes up, and then you see, I'm sitting there all sleepy out with my coffee, and they come in there with a zip-lock bag and a toothpick. But, Daddy, the Tooth Fairy didn't come. Y'all, am I the only one? So one time what I did, I said, you know what? Hold on, hold on. I said, uh, go in there and brush your teeth. Get ready for the day. Leave, leave your tooth here. I said, uh, let me see what I can find out. I'll send them an email. <laughs> so I went to the computer, and then I checked, and it turned out that Laura received an email from the tooth fairy explaining the situation. That he had been a really busy night, but that he had would make it very soon and be on the lookout in front of that pillow. So we pulled her over there to the computer, we read the message, we explained the whole thing, she runs to her pillow, and guess what? He had come during that time. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. He's faithful. <laughs> tell you, you don't have to be a perfect parent. You don't have to be a perfect parent. But you do, House of Grace, have to parent on purpose. Parent on purpose. Amen? That's what we're going to talk about today. Parenting on purpose. There's a lot of ideas out there about parenting. There's a lot of books. And I'm going to tell you, I consider myself a pretty pretty good dad. And, I, and I, I'm going to tell you some stuff about my daddy. I might, might disclose a couple things about him. You might be fun with that. But this is a book, I'm just going to brag on myself a little bit. It's okay, all right? Y'all, uh, it's not very Christian. But this book is called The Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Clear. Y'all remember that one? Yeah. Pastor Shane's like, yeah, yeah. You got this in your office, Pastor Shane? Just finish it this one. The Mouse and the Motorcycle. The other night, uh, I started reading this to my kids. And we started, we read chapter one. Now I gotta get on, we gotta get to chapter two because I don't know what's gonna happen. It's, it's kind of a cliffhanger right now between chapter one and chapter two. Uh, but Jolie Kate and I were reading this and she really enjoyed it. And, and that's because I'm a good dad. But what you don't know is I started reading, the reason we're reading this book is because I lost the last book that I forgot we were reading because by the time I got back into the book eight chapters in, I couldn't remember how to do all the voices. You ever forget the voices? And I was reading one voice, and the kids were like, no, Daddy, that's not how they sound. That's so-and-so's voice. And by the time, so that book, we don't even know how that book, there is no resolution to that book. And I can't even find it. But this book is going well so far. I'm doing the best I can. Look at somebody say, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Tell them, you don't have to be a perfect parent. But you do have to parent on purpose. Now, let's talk about the purpose of parenting. This is where you actually want to start writing notes. The purpose of parenting. Again, there's a lot of books. There's a lot of ideas out there. And some of you have heard me teach on parenting before. Some of the things I share today are the things that I always share because they're that important. Uh, and some of you have never heard what I'm going to say, so it'll be new and fresh. But let me just go ahead and skip right to the chase. The purpose of parenting is not to produce good kids. <laughs> The purpose of parenting is not to produce good kids. That's a noble idea, but it's not the purpose of parenting. It's not the primary purpose, but not even close. Uh, and the purpose of parenting is not to, well, I just want my kids to have the things I didn't have. Now, that sounds very noble. It's also very American uh, to say, I want my kids to have the things. Or if we don't want to sound materialistic, we say have the opportunities, but we really mean the things. Because the opportunity is to suddenly get money so they get the things. We don't say it like that because that sounds materialistic. 
But it sounds very noble to say that I'm just trying, I want them to go farther than I went. Those are all noble and, and well intended, but I want you to know those are not the primary purposes of parenting. And you may also, some days, on a bad day, you might think the primary purpose of parenting is just to survive. Can I get an amen on that? I'm just trying to make it. I'm just trying not to lose my well, as real as that is, it's not the primary purpose of parenting. The primary purpose of parenting is this. You can research this in the Bible. Don't worry, we're going to get in the Bible. If you go back to the purpose of a child, then what you need to understand is they are just a young man or a young woman. So the purpose of a young man is the same purpose of all men. The purpose of a young woman is the purpose of women. And we go back to the beginning. If you want to understand the purpose, you go to the beginning and you talk to the manufacturer, the producer, the creator. In the book of Genesis, we see that Adam and Eve were created to be what I call friends of God. Friends of God. You can teach your kids. You can potty train them. You can teach them their ABCs, their times tables, how to drive a car, how to balance their checkbook. That's all wonderful and they need it. But if they leave your house, and they haven't learned to be a friend of God, yes. then I would say that we probably missed our primary purpose yes. in parenting. Yes. So we need to understand what the purpose is. The purpose is to raise little men and little women that become friends of God. If you would just say, friends of God. Friends of God. Well, I'm just trying to keep them from getting pregnant and get them, get them a high school diploma. Okay. Well, then you're missing it. I'm just trying to keep them not, 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 not. If, if you are managing behavior rather than uh, shaping a heart, then you are missing the primary purpose of parenting. Because we, we are trying to produce friends of God. Now, if you say, well, that sounds very Christian, very good, what is a friend of God? I'm so glad you asked. I define it with three uh, phases or three elements. The first part of being a friend of God is experiencing the love of God. If you don't experience the love of God, then he's just a dictator. But when you experience the love of God, he becomes a father. That's a good place to say it, man. I listen to certain of my own amens from time to time. Experience the love of God. Second of all, if you're going to be a friend of God, I remember Jesus saying something like this to his disciples. He said, I no longer call you servants. I now call you my Friends. He said, because I let you in on, I, on the things that I'm doing. He said, I tell you stuff. Yeah. See, when you have a friend, you talk to friends. Yeah. If, you, if you have somebody that you don't ever talk to, I promise you're not friends. You might be friends on Facebook, but you're not real friends. Right. And God is looking for friends. Did yeah. you know that? Yeah. He's looking for friends. Uh, not because he's lonely, but because he's awesome. It's not like us, but we're looking for friends to complete us. We're, he's looking for friends to reveal his completeness. Yeah. Yeah. He's so good. If he kept it all to himself, he'd be selfish. Isn't that, isn't that true? So he's trying to produce friends of God. We have to experience his love. Then we learn to hear his voice. But a true friend will not just hear his voice. They will obey his voice. A true friend doesn't just say, Jesus, I appreciate you talking to me. You know, if, if my wife sends me a text and it says, roses are on sale at Walmart. <laughs> and I say, I hear you. <laughs> well, no, what will determine whether I heard her is what if I walk in the door of roses or not. Right. See, when God says something, it's because he's asking us to do something, to respond. So if, if we're true friends, I'm going to walk in with roses. I'm going to say, thank you for telling me that, baby. And she said, you better know what I said. <laughs> I can get the hint. Well, we got, so if I experience his love, and I begin to hear his voice, and then I actually obey it, I can define myself, even with my imperfections, and I'm in progress, I am a friend of God. Now, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and another voice they don't follow. So oftentimes I tell people, if you want to know if you're saved or not, I would ask you, do you hear the voice of God? They think that that's preacher stuff. Well, I, do. I don't hear him like you hear him. Well, why not? I don't hear him like other people hear him. But I'm progressing in my hearing. I'm growing in hearing. Uh, and I, it seems to me that my hearing grows as my doing grows. 
And Jesus, he, when he, remember, he taught parables, and he would say, uh, take away from this man and give to this one who already has. And he was teaching on those who will do with what they hear. He said, the, what you do with the words I say determines how much I will say to you. Did you hear that? Go study it out. Read the Bible. It's good stuff. Amen? Amen. So we want to create friends of God. So their purpose is no different than your purpose. It's just that they've got a coach. So the purpose of a child is to become a friend of God. Let me just talk to you uh, briefly about some responsibilities of parenting. Uh, I'm just going to kind of break these down. The first responsibility of a parent is to be a caretaker. To be a caretaker. This is the most, everybody just say duh. That's what we said when I was growing up, duh. It was kind of a rude thing we did, it was fun. And when somebody said something that was obvious, we said duh. Well, to, to say that a parent is called to be a caretaker is a big fat duh. Uh, the baby can't even, you know, go to the bathroom. The baby can't even hold a bottle. I mean, he can't feed himself, he can't clean himself. He doesn't know his own name. That kind of person needs help. And, uh, and so we're called to take care of or to be a caretaker. Uh, now, uh, if I have another message another day, I may talk about the different things and the different roles and things that we're trying to insert within a child's heart in different seasons of their life. And if you don't learn to transition out of caretaker, then you go from being a caretaker to an entitlement. See, if you're still a caretaker when they're 25, then you become an enabler. And you, you're no longer helping, but you become hurting, but you're doing the same things that were awesome when they were two. But you've got to understand the different seasons of parenting. So caretaker is, is a beginning thing, but we're phasing out of this thing. Pastor Shane, you probably don't do for Emily what you did five years ago, do you? You're, you're, you're changing what caretaking looks like, and, and, and you're actually focusing more on the second responsibility, which I call heart shaping. Heart shaping. Sounds like an art class. Heart shaping. You may know it better as character building. Write this down. You are a responsible parent, and I am responsible for shaping and building the character of my children. For shaping and building the character. That's the big deal. That's where we're steering, molding, God chipping off. You know, in, in the book of Isaiah, the prophet said, and then Jesus one day picked up the scroll and began to read in the prophet Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has called me to preach good news to the sick, to the poor. And then it goes on. And he says, and you'll hear Mama B quote this verse a lot. He says, he has called me to uh, tear down and root up and to plant and to build up. So there's, the, and, and a lot of times we think that's just for preachers and just for ministry. But you have a ministry to your child. There are some things within the heart of a child that need to be rooted out. There are some things that need to be broken off. But that's not enough. Then you actually have to know what's supposed to go in that hole. You've got to put something in where you put something out. Or guess what? It just comes back. Or even worse, you create a good person that's not a friend of God. And a good person that's not a friend of God falls into the trap of self-righteousness. And, and it's called being a Pharisee. And it's called saying, I think I'm pretty good because I've learned to manage this behavior and on the outside. Even though my heart is black on the inside, I can't see. Because I judge myself by my behavior. And I keep comparing myself to you and I think I'm alright. That's the kind of people Jesus was dealing with when he said I didn't come for the well. I came for the sick. You've got to know you're sick. So as you're shaping your child's heart, one of the biggest things that needs to be done from an early age. Please don't wait till your child is 13 to start talking about Jesus. Don't you do that. you got to start this thing early. you got to start bringing them to the cross early. And somebody say Early. They need to know that they need a Savior. They need to know from an early age that we are born in desperate need of a Savior. They, they understand that they do bad things. They understand that they make mistakes. Now, I'm not there to beat them over the head for that and make them feel terrible. But what I'm having to do is say, hey, you know, that, 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 that. That's what Daddy was talking about the other day when Daddy said, we all need a Savior because we make mistakes. And the Bible calls those mistakes sin. And they come from our heart. That's why Jesus came, baby girl. That's why Jesus came. We all need a Savior. Savior. Bring your kids to Jesus early. Point them to the cross early. Somebody say early. Early. Proverbs 22.6. Thank you. You said a Bible verse. Proverbs 22.6. But I've been saying Bible verses the whole time. 
Proverbs 22 to 6, many of you know this. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child. Somebody say, train up. Train up a child. That word train, you can study that out. Uh, training up a child means that you're actually intentional. See, again, I said you don't have to be a perfect parent, but you have to parent on purpose. You have to understand the purpose of the child, and then you guide your parenting to that purpose all the time with the goal of creating a friend of God who experiences his love, hears his voice, and obeys his voice. Yes. We can do this. We can do this. God wouldn't have put us in this situation if we couldn't do it. In fact, it's not even as hard as we make it. Because the Holy Spirit will do it through us. He is the Father. He is the He knows how to do His job. Amen. So train up a child. Now, uh, training is, is more than just uh, discipline. Training has to do with informing, with modeling. Sometimes we struggle because we don't model what we preach. Well. And they look at us and we say, I don't say, don't do what I do, do what I. And they say, no, I'll always do what you do. So, we have to train them. There's a training element. You can study that scripture out, and there's such a, there's such a knowing involved in training. You, see, I, I can teach you from the pulpit today. I can teach you and share this word. But if we really, if I was coaching you, if you said, Joy, would you come in? We've got some situations in my house that are a little more complicated than what you were saying, or we don't know how to apply that principle. Would you come help us? And we come over, and we sit in the living room, and we talk about when this scenario and this and that. And I begin to hear your story, and I begin to see your heart. And I see where you want to be, and I see where you are, and I see what you need to get. I am now entering into the realm of training. Because there's a knowing, there's a relationship. See, what happens too many times is we try to manage the behavior of a child, and, and even if we understand how to discipline, which most people don't know how to discipline or don't believe in it or don't understand it, but even if we know how to do that, we don't understand that the whole thing is about a heart. It's not about a behavior. So we don't have the bridge of relationship that the discipline has to travel across. Therefore, it doesn't reach the heart. It only reaches the behind. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Say amen. Just say amen. Yeah. Yes, that's true. See, a lot of times, we, we, even if we do discipline, because we don't have the time invested into the child's heart, yeah. they don't receive it as discipline. They receive it as simple correction, as frustration, as a failure. And oftentimes, let me say this, because I don't know how much I'm going to get to share from my message, but let, let me say this. The, the parenting is not a black ops mission. You know what I mean by that? In the military, they have what they call black ops. Operations that they are surrounded by secrecy. Nobody really knows why they're doing what they're doing. It's just they had orders to do it, so you just do it and you don't ask questions. And nobody really knows what that present is. just trickled down and we're all just following order. Sometimes we do that as we interact with our kids. Our kids have no idea what the mission is. They just keep getting orders from the sergeant. Why don't you let them in on what we're doing? They can handle it. And what do I mean by that? Okay, well, for example, let your child know. I'm here to take care of you. I'm here to love you. I'm here to model the Father. I'm here to, to teach you. But the main thing I'm here to do is build your character. So as we go along in life, there's going to be times where I say, hey, this right here, your character, we're going to work on that. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. We're going to work on this right here. We're not going to work on ten things. Because you can't handle it, and neither can I. And Jesus doesn't do me like that. I'm not going to do you like that. We're going to identify this one or two things in your character. And that doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you a bad child. It makes you human. It makes you in need of a Savior. So we're going to identify this thing. And I'm going to walk with you through this. We're going to talk about it. And when it comes up, I'm going to call it out. And then when I call it out, we're going to pray about it. If it requires discipline, if it requires negative uh, motivation, I promise I'll bring it. Because I'm committed to you. And I'm committed to your success to become a friend of God. Not because you get on my nerves. But because I love you and I'm committed to making you a friend of God. I will answer to God the Father himself on how I did this thing. Don't you know we're accountable for this? Thank you, Lord, for grace. So, I'm going to call out this character thing. And we're going to partner together. 
If, you, if you're a single mom, you can do this. If you're a single dad, you can do this. If you're married, you can do this. But you just need to communicate. Put it out there in the open. If there's a character issue, if I said, you know what, there's a, you got an issue with the mouse and the motorcycle. Call it out. Uh, it just said, hey, when I see you uh, demonstrating the mouse and the motorcycle in your behavior, in your attitude, in your uh, lack of responsibility, if I see this manifesting, I'm not going to turn the other way. But I'm also not just going to get frustrated with you and, brrr, and shoot you with it. I'm going to call out, what are we really dealing with here? It seems to me that the Holy Spirit has revealed in your heart there's a mouse and motorcycle. And we need to deal with it. And sometimes that's not, I don't know about you, but when, when God's dealing with my character, it's usually more than a one-time event. I love it when I come down here and I just say, Lord, I just give this problem to you, and I just think you for taking it, and I walk away changed. That is amazing. But most of the time, that ain't how it goes. It's me going, okay, God, let's work on this. Holy Spirit, help me with this character. He's, like, he's identified, I've been in the Word, he's working on me. And then I was like, it pops up. I didn't know it was going to pop It's just still in there. still a little bit in there. And he'll pull it out and say, how much do we work on this? It's a process. Somebody say it's a process. This is a journey, man. So let your kid know that we're not in a secret organization. We're not doing a secret service mission here. We are going to work on your character. I'm committed to you. Say committed. Committed. Just help everybody. Yeah. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Famous parenting passage. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Oh, parents, we love this one. We love this one. Make your kids memorize it. It's fun. Children, obey your what? Yes. yes, hallelujah. We like it. In the Lord, for this is right. And then he goes old school, Old Testament. Because God will kill you. No, that's the say that. It says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. That it may be well with you. And you may live long on the earth. We like to preach that one. But we might want to read the next verse. Yeah. And you fathers. And I would insert mothers. Do not provoke your children to wrath. But bring them up in the training. Oh there's that word again. Yeah. And admonition. Of the Lord. Not of the world. Of the Lord. Somebody say of the Lord. It sounds like, he, and you can study this out as well, there's lots of good phrases there in the Greek, but there's definitely a, uh, a knowing, there's a relationship, and there's a, he's basically saying, you know what, you can also drive your kids crazy. And all the teenagers just did a silent amen, and I heard it in my spirit. <laughs> you remember when you were a teenager, don't you? You were so smart. <laughs> and cool. Yeah, the older we get, the less good we are and the less we know. But we do know this, the Bible says that we have a responsibility to our children to find a way to train without breaking the spirit of a child. See, uh, if, if, I, if I was to really break this down into a little couple notes, I would say you've got to find a way to train that's stern when it needs to be stern, it's loving when it needs to be loving, but it's a building. I, I am so invested in you. I, I so love you. And I've already spent time with you building this relationship so that you know that I love you. Not so that you'll like me. I'm not trying to run for president with you. I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm responsible. And I built this relationship so that I can train you and you know what I'm trying to do. And when I mess up, I fess up. If I mess up, I say, Daddy lost his mind for a minute there. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I was a jerk. It's good for them to hear that. They shouldn't have to hear it every two minutes, but it's real. Amen? Amen. So parent on purpose. And I would say this, if you had to just break it down like a third grader, that's what I do for myself. I would say, don't be mean. Say, don't be mean. Don't be mean. If you wouldn't say it to uh, your boss at work or your neighbor or somebody that you honor, then don't say it to your kids. Have you ever been to Walmart? It seems like, and, I'm, and nothing against Walmart, but it seems like if you want to see what the world really acts like, you can go to Walmart. Especially in the parking lot. They might put up, even though they're still in pajamas, I don't understand that. But inside, they actually maintain a little bit of normalcy. 
But when they get in the, I have heard people say things to their kids in the parking lot. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I wanted to slap a couple of folks. Spirit of slap came on me. I was like, I mean, cussing, uh, be berated. I was like, did you speak to that child? I, and I know you're, I'm looking at them, they need something. But that ain't what they need. Do you know what they're going to do? Same thing. Talk to children like they're dogs. So I would say, don't be mean and don't uh, be mean. You know, you know, uh, uh, Demean, I'm sorry. Demean. The word demean, I looked it up because I wasn't sure. Demean means to degrade, to belittle, to insult, embarrass. <coughs> humiliate would be a better word. If you feel like you need to humiliate your children to get them in line, you've got a problem. And you, you, need to get, you need to get it straight. You need to say, Jesus, I got a little issue. And maybe it was learning. I'm like, I'm like, just deal with it. And we, we all messed up. We, yeah, we didn't come with a manual for this, and we, re we did, but we really didn't realize it. And so we're doing the best we can, but oftentimes the best we can is not that great. But you have the best father inside of you. Let him move. Put him in charge. He will help us. He will help us. He will teach us all things. Uh, Proverbs 13, 24. I've just got a couple more verses. There's no way I could. We're, we're going to talk about this some more last, next week. I see that now. Let me do this. Um, let me talk about discipline and we'll write this thing down. Um, Proverbs 13, 24 is a misquoted verse in the Bible oftentimes. It's he who spares his rod hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Somebody say promptly. Oh. Oftentimes we hear this verse saying he who spares the rod spoils the child. Uh, that's true. But it's not all of the verse said. It says he hates. What strong language. I mean, who had the nerve to write that? Oh, it was Solomon, the smartest man in the world. Okay, well then, maybe we should listen to him. Uh, <clears throat> he said, he who spares the rod, the rod of correction. He's obviously referring to a physical type of discipline that brings pain to the behind. And, and he, it seems to me he's advocating. You agree with that? that he, I mean, you, you, you may say, well, we've evolved. I didn't evolve. Uh, I'm just, the more I, I see what God says, the more I try God's way of doing things, the more it works. So I, I figure if he knows what he's doing in finances, he knows what he's doing in parenting. And if he wrote this book, he must be serious about it. So we don't think that we have evolved past God's word. And you say, well, isn't that, isn't that uh, inhumane? No, it's not inhumane. It's, it's humane. See, why is it humane? Look at Proverbs 19, 18. Proverbs 19, 18. Chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. Did you hear that, church? Chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. I'm not brilliant, but it seems like while there is hope indicates there could be a point where there is no more hope. You might want to step into this window of obedience and learn how to discipline in love, God's way, actually effective. While there is hope, and do not be bent on his destruction. Nobody wants to destroy their kids. Nobody. I, I've never met anybody so I just would like to ruin my kids' life. I'd like Proverbs 22, 15. Why, why do we need to discipline our kids? I'm glad you asked. Proverbs 22, 15 says this. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. I didn't write it. I'm just reading it. I know you don't like it. But this is the truth. We're all born with a heart full of foolishness. And there's a difference in foolishness and childishness. Childishness means they're silly, uh, they tie their shoes together on accident, uh, they forgot to get to the potty in time, or they spilled their milk over cereal, or they just did something you know, childish. That's not foolish. Foolishness has to do with selfishness and rebellion. Let me say that again. Foolishness has ingredients of selfishness and rebellion. Rebellion means you're not the boss of me. And the truth is we all have some of that in us. And if you don't get that out early, it will wreak havoc for you for the rest of your life. 
Because we don't understand submission and authority and God's ways of doing things, we end up bucking on everything, every employer, everybody's against us, and, and we can't hold down a job, or we can't finish school, or we don't like to teach. There's always a teacher who, you know this person? Maybe, maybe you might struggle being this person? Well, it might be because we all still deal with foolishness that's bound up in the heart of man and woman. And God is trying to drive it far from us. He's trying to help us. But we're going to have to cooperate. We can run around this right here. <laughs> you ain't hurting nobody but you. The Bible says a wise man loves instruction. He, he takes correction. He appreciates it. But the fool spits it out. Proverbs 23, one chapter over, verse 13 and 14. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Golly! That ain't even the message Bible, that's New King James. We're too smart for this stuff, but we might want to regress back into biblical, you know, being biblical so we can see biblical results, so we can see biblical blessings, so that our child can be saved from destruction, can be saved from hell. My goodness. My goodness. Because, you know, Proverbs also says there is a road that seems right unto man, but in the end it leads to destruction. There's a way that seems right. Pastor Larry wrote a song about it. Well, you need to understand that every child ever born on the planet is born on that highway. Do, do you see that? We are all born hell bound. There is a sin disease inside of us. The Bible says no one. We all fall short of the glory. It says while we were yet sinners. It says I was conceived in sin. There is a sin disease inside of me that produces not only behavior, it produces a heart of rebellion. It produces a heart of independence from God. It produces a heart of self-righteousness. It produces a heart of apathy, a heart of, of total rebellion, saying there is no God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So, that's inside of me when I'm born. That's inside of you when you were born. And if, if we don't run to the cross of Jesus and say, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior, be the boss, take this heart and begin to do your work, then we're left with that. But your child is wonderful and cute. And you're, nobody has cuter kids in the world than me. And if you agree with that for yourself, say amen. amen. But foolishness is bound up in that cute little heart. And if you don't take the job of bringing it out with correction, love, and discipline, then you have failed your child. And then we try to bring them to church. Well, I just want to raise them in church. Well, please do raise them in church. That's wonderful. But we are not a magic pill that's going to get your kid to Jesus. We're going to do our best to bring them to the cross for two hours a week. What are you going to do the rest? Well, I just want to raise them in church. Raise, we're going to partner with you. We're going to supplement. We're going to be the vitamin, but you're going to cook the meals. You can do this, but you've got to parent on purpose. You don't have to be perfect, but you've got to have a purpose. You've got to know where you're going, and then we can learn how to get there. But we actually got to decide it's worth it. It's not going to be easy. Amen? Discipline, discipline. So, again, I understand there comes a time, you know, there comes a size of the child when perhaps they're bigger than you. And, uh, you know, different scenarios play out. But discipline may change over time, but especially in the younger years. And you, you, you pray, God will lead you. God's big enough to guide you in your house. But I can, it varies, I believe, from child and house and whatever. But for the younger years, the formative early years, there must be uh, some physical discipline. The rod of correction must be in the picture. It's not a let me beat you till you pass out. I'm not trying to make marks on your body. But if you fake me out and you cry, and then like 10 seconds later, you're like, I'm coming back. <laughs> I'm back. So, and I, I've seen, you know, we've all been around for a minute, right? We have kids, many of us. We've done it right. We've done it wrong. I've done it all wrong. I've done it all right. And I've been in between. You know, I'm still growing with this thing. Uh, but I have 
seen, I have seen some people, not in this church, because we're all amazing, um, but in the world, at Walmart, I've seen people spank their kids. You didn't spank them. You didn't spank them. You, you, sometimes, some of you, I'm, I'm just going to be real, you can be mad, just pray for me. I've seen some of y'all, I, I, I don't know the truth of what happened, but I felt like I could be wrong. Sometimes we spank out of we know we're supposed to, and we're in public, and the preacher was watching the kid act crazy, and so you give him a couple. You're trying to do it for me. Don't spank him for me. I don't care. That's your kid. Don't spank him for me. Don't spank him for the, uh, the, the youth pastor. Don't spank him for, don't spank him for their free caterer. Don't spank him for, spank him for them. Do it for them because you love them. And if you go to spank them, my goodness, spank them. Don't hop out there behind Some days uh, he'd get home from work and I'd say, Dad, let's throw the football. 
you ever come from work and you're tired? Nobody to make that. And uh, I said, let's start the football. And I, I look like I say tired. When you're nine, you don't care if they're tired. You want to throw the football. And we get out there, and I, many, many, um, way more times than not, he said, okay, okay, let's go there for about 10 minutes. And we'd get out there, and we'd throw the ball. I was never great at throwing the football, but I did learn to catch that thing. And I'd take off this way, and he'd leave, bam, hit me on the run. Bam, hit me on the run. I mean, we'd just do it over and over. I couldn't get enough of it. And he would spend time with me, uh, even though he was tired. He would invest in that relationship, and that made a big difference. When the time came for him to give me discipline, he had the solid bridge of relationship built to where he could travel across and deal with my heart. Okay? Now, he's also the same man that ate my ice cream and blamed it on my imaginary friend. <laughs> Story. It was the last ice cream. Before I laid down for my nap, I was four years old. I'm still going to counseling over this. I said, Daddy, don't eat my ice cream. He said, oh. I woke up from my nap, ready to watch Scooby Doo. It was four o'clock. I opened the freezer. No, I said, Can you get a nap? Daddy, 